Yes, yes, good morning, Mangi, Louis, uh, Abhinash. Welcome, everyone. Um, so let's pray and then we can uh, get started for uh, today. I would like to request someone, maybe Anita, would you be comfortable to pray? Yes, Pastor. Yeah, hmm. please go ahead. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, Father God. Father, we bless your name, we praise your name, and give you glory for the another opportunity, O Lord Father, to meet together, O Lord Father, to come together, to learn from your word, Dada. Almighty, O Lord Father, Lord Jesus, all of our days, all of our time, everything, O Lord Father, it's, O Lord Father, Lord Jesus, is beneficial in you only, O Lord Father, Lord Jesus, is productive and creative in you only, O Lord. Father, for you are the source of life and joy and the good pleasures, O Lord Father. Father, we give you glory and give you praises, O Lord. Father, I commit pastor into your hand, O Lord Father. Father, Lord Jesus, all the words that she speaks, O Lord Father, let it be from your wisdom, Dada, and let it penetrate our heart and mind, O Lord Father, that every word, O Lord Father, Lord Jesus, would be, O Lord Father, Lord Jesus, would make a home in our mind. And heart, O oh Lord Father, Lord Jesus, that we would grab on those words, O oh Lord Father, and O oh Lord Father, dwell on them, O oh Lord Father, Lord Jesus, till that the time that it invites in us, O oh Lord Father, for your glory, O oh Lord Father, that everything that we do shall glorify your name, Dada. We love you, love you, Dada, and we commit each one of us into your hand. That, that I commit this time into your hand. Lead us, Dada, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, for leading us in that wonderful time of prayer. Uh, this morning, we are going to continue from where we stopped. So the last uh, uh, week, there were two sections, and uh, in both of them, we basically looked at what the prophetic word means, that is God speaking in the now, and how we can perceive that prophetic word. We also saw the uh, progression, how one can... Um, uh, be a prophesying believer or depending on the call of God and the grace of God that has been given to people, you know, one could have a prophetic ministry or, uh, you know, some are also called into the office of a prophet. So uh, that is also something that we looked at. But all of these things, we uh, just had an uh, overview and uh, we will delve deeper into uh, these the, the grace, the prophetic grace, we will delve deeper into perceiving the prophetic uh, word from God a little later on. But uh, for us to have a really good foundation here in our publication, we are going to begin with uh, understanding the prophetic ministry in the Old Testament. So this is uh, the display of the prophetic ministry. So you could take it like a survey. Okay, from the Old Testament. So that is here in chapter 2. And that's what we are going to uh, look at first. And then we will go on to studying about the prophetic ministry in the New Testament. Uh, so yeah, we'll, uh, I'll share what is here in our notes for us. But if you would like to stop me anywhere to clarify your doubts, that's you know totally all right. So uh, do... Uh, unmute yourself and ask the questions or post on the chat and we'll try and take it up even in between the class and, and that should be okay. Okay, so uh, if you have your notes open with you, uh, let's go to chapter 2, which is on page number 27. Uh, and this is about the prophetic ministry in the Old Testament. So here uh, we begin by understanding how God gave direction to his people. There were many ways in which God communicated to the people in the Old Covenant. Now, in the Old Covenant, we have to understand, uh, in the Old Testament, we, we have to understand that the Holy Spirit was not yet given to every believer. And so, the communication of God came through certain men and women who were positioned you know, as priests or who are positioned as prophets. So the communication of God primarily came through these individuals and uh, in a certain manner. Uh, so it's quite different from how God's communication comes to us today as believers because now we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, so there is a big difference in the way uh, we will observe God speaking in the Old Testament and the way God is speaking today. So this is just for our understanding. You know, we don't have to really. Um, uh, for example, I'm going to begin with Urim and Thummim. Okay, some stones that were were used to hear from God. So as a believer today, I don't have to uh, use some of these methods to hear from God. You know, we don't have to go with you know precious stones or uh, in the Old Testament you also have practices like you cast lots to figure out what God is saying. So. The, these are all things that we don't need to do anymore. So this is just for our understanding. So in the Old Testament, we uh, see the use of what is known as Urim and Thummim. Now, uh, there isn't too much understanding of how exactly God communicated through uh, these stones, but we know that they were used okay, uh, to understand what, God's opinion on a matter was. So generally you would have a, a priestly priestly garment and uh, on top of that robe you would have you know certain uh, stones that were set and the priests would go they would approach the presence of God and they would they would inquire of the Lord and you know God would communicate to them um, uh, and let them know Know whether something is a right choice or if it was a wrong choice. So uh, the Urim and Thummim, by interpretation, they are understood as lights and perfections, um, also known as revelation and truth. So basically they were gemstones carried on the ephod of the high priest. So uh, maybe, you know, the way God communicated was some light would shine uh, on a particular uh, gemstone and then you know that would mean yes go for war or you know or uh, uh, i'm pleased with you and another if the light would shine on another stone it would mean don't go or uh, there is there is sin and i'm displeased with you so you see the use of urim and thummim in different places uh, particularly there is one example which is mentioned here in our notes uh, it's the time when saul inquires of the lord to find out, you know, whether there is sin in him uh, and his son Jonathan or the army, and uh, uh, he, uh, you know, does it this way. And finally, the the result, you know, God reveals to to Saul that the sin was, um, it was attributed to Jonathan, and Jonathan was the one who needed to be punished. So this was the way in which. The Old Testament people inquired of the Lord. You have another example in the notes where Joshua, you know, in the Numbers 27, where uh, he, through Urim and Thummim, traces the sin to uh, Achan uh, and, and uh, the defeat of Ai or Ai, the, the place follows you know, from there. So uh, this is the initial you know communication of god that we see so today for us as believers i began by saying that you know we don't really depend on this kind of uh, a prophetic understanding so what is it that communicates god's yes or god's no or something if something is right or wrong to us we see in colossians chapter 3 and verse 15 that the peace of god is our empire so by the perceiving of the peace of God, you and I can understand if you know, God uh, is for a, a certain decision or not. Okay? And as believers, as we grow in the Lord uh, and over time, as we meditate uh, upon the word of God, this peace becomes very obvious. So we uh, we could even pick it up like really quickly and know what God's will is on certain matters uh, because you know, the Holy Spirit works to the peace in our hearts, uh, which becomes the indicator or the guide. Okay, so this, uh, the Urim and Thummim was one of the methods with which people received God's answers. Now, moving forward, you know, we uh, see here in our notes that a word from a prophet Okay, I already told us that God had God had positioned priests. So priests with their ephod, they could figure out what God was saying. But also the 
prophets would hear from God. And we'd see the experience of Balaam the prophet, uh, the way he saw in the spirit realm, the way he heard the voice of God, you know, the way he fell down with his eyes open. So things like that, you know, prophets would perceive and hear from God and communicate that message to the people. In uh, the book of Samuel, the first Samuel 9, verse 9, uh, there, there, there is a statement where people those days, you know, if they wanted an answer to a question with, that they had, they would they would say something like, okay, let us go to the seer. Why seer? You remember, we have uh, looked at the different kinds of perception. So the more visual kind of, the visual prophet was called as a seer. So people would just say, let's go to a seer or let's go to a prophet. Uh, and then we would be able to inquire of the Lord. Uh, a, a good example is that of Jehoshaphat. So Jehoshaphat in 2 Kings chapter 3, he needs an answer from the Lord. And at that time, Jehoshaphat, uh, 2 Kings 3, and he asked the question, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here who poured water on the hands of Elijah. So basically there is a call to Elisha to come and reveal the mind of God or the will of God regarding a certain matter. So this is the manner in which the people in the Old Testament heard from God. Now again, if you just look at the parallel uh, in the New Testament, we, are, we as God's people who are filled with the Holy Spirit are told that we are led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit in us bears witness Okay, uh, to our spirits. This is in Romans 8 uh, verses uh, 16, being led by the spirit, the spirit bearing witness with us, verse 14. And so uh, we really don't have to go around asking for it. Okay, so today, if a new uh, uh, covenant believer goes around waiting on prophets, nothing wrong with it. Right? Nothing wrong uh, with receiving a word from a prophet, but the primary way in which we receive God's communication and we go about our lives has to be the word of God, isn't it? Because the word of God, that is the light to our path. And in addition to that, we saw how the Holy Spirit leads us. So we already have these resources that are meant to lead and guide us in our lives. Uh, and so a word from a prophet can be what we could term as a, a confirmatory word or a complementary word. Okay? So in addition to the most basic uh, resources for a believer, you know, we add the prophetic word and that guides us uh, in the direction of our life. So that's how it's supposed to be for a New Testament believer. So for a for a uh, for us at this point to go from prophetic conference to prophetic conference, prophet to prophet, and say, "Hey, uh, I need a word. I need a word," it wouldn't be very biblical. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. But we will come back to this discussion later on. But in the Old Testament, yes, if they needed to hear from God, they did the right thing, which was to say that uh, they wanted a to meet a seer or a prophet, because that was the only way the anointing of the Lord would come upon certain people and they would communicate God's message to them. Okay, let's keep moving on and see other things about the prophetic in the Old uh, Testament. Okay, the true test of a prophetic word. I remember somebody asked me this in the last uh, uh, couple of sessions. The true test of the prophetic word is revealed in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Uh, I would like to request somebody in the class to read it out aloud, and then you know we'll, we'll try to glean insights from there. So uh, anyone, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. Yeah, could you please unmute and read it out? Uh, 
uh, Deuteronomy 13, 1 yeah. to 5. If there arises yes. among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the word of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the, the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for reading that passage aloud. Uh, and it's quite uh, self-explanatory for us where uh, God is telling the people that if there is a so-called prophet among you, a okay, prophet or a dreamer of dreams, meaning uh, somebody who receives God's communication. Do you recall? We said that God speaks through um, symbols. He speaks through signs. Right? He, he speaks through a word. So these are all ways in which God communicated to his prophets. So if there is someone who calls themselves a prophet and gives a word, and this word uh, tells us to go after, in this passage, it's very direct. You know, let us go after other gods. Now, anyone in uh, with their understanding of who God is and his you know, already revealed uh, word would know that this cannot be God because even to his people, Israel, he had said, you know, if you look at the commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. You, you will only worship me. And that was a commandment from the Lord. So how can a word which is in contradiction to what God has already spoken be accepted? When we are testing a prophetic word, even in the Old Testament, the people were, were instructed. If there is a word which is not in conformity to the integrity of the revealed word, and the revealed word instructs us on the person of God, the character of God. Now, if there, there is a prophet who tells you otherwise, okay, so first of all, he tells you otherwise, and it his word is not in integrity with what has already been revealed okay, uh, about the uh, the person of God and the nature of God and uh, the purpose of God and all of that. And in addition to that, if the word that the prophet has spoken draws you away from God and draws you away from uh, what God has done in our lives. So we could even say uh, that Let's say the word says you can do whatever you want and you know you live in your sinful habits. It's okay. God is with you and all. It's drawing you away from God because we know that God has set us free. He has redeemed us from sin, but he wants us to live a holy life because scripture says, you know, be holy as I am holy. So the word should not take you away from God. Okay, uh, that is another test. Is this word taking me away from God? Is it taking me away from the purpose of God for my life? So we we test these things. Uh, uh, and yeah, so we've already said that it has to be in harmony with God has already revealed. Uh, yes, now in addition to this, we can talk about the accuracy of the word, you know, whether the word was fulfilled or not, and, uh, you know, have those debates. That is is the last question that we would ask but the the true prophetic word the test of a true prophetic word is if it is in conformity with the revealed uh, will of god and if that prophetic word draws us closer to god okay so that is what even the 
uh, children of Israel were asked to look into. So how much more we? So we take it as it is and we can use that uh, even today as a test for the prophetic word. So a true prophetic word, a genuine prophetic word will strengthen our walk with the Lord. It will uh, cause us to know God better and worship him more. And that is the real uh, genuine prophetic word. Now let's move on from here. Uh, we also see in the Old Testament that there were creative forms of the prophetic expression. So what do we mean by that? You know, the prophetic word uh, in many places, we will see prophets say things like, thus says the Lord, and then they will you know, speak the word uh, uh, over the lives of the people. But in other places, the prophetic word has come through uh, in the form of poetry. If you read the Psalms, you know, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, well, what is all that? It's, it's a depiction of the Trinity. Uh, and, you know, later on, you would see that even in the New Testament, you, know, you find that uh, passage in the book of Hebrews where, where you understand the interaction of the father with the son. But when David was writing it, he probably did not know that in the poetry that he's releasing, you know, there is a the, there is a prophetic messianic understanding of who Christ is and, you know, what the Trinity is, things that sort of uh, uh, bypassed his own finite understanding were being written by him. And similarly, you know, many of the Psalms, you find uh, prophetic words that have been weaved into that. Now we find places uh, where, you know, Moses, Moses' prophetic song of blessing uh, over the people. It was prophetic, but it was it came through as a song. You know, Moses never uh, said things like, thus says the Lord. You don't see him doing things like that. However, we would attribute words such as those to Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, prophets like that. However, Moses is a prophet. Right? But how did the prophetic word get released from his life? You find a prophetic song written by Moses. Uh, Nathan, Nathan the prophet. You know, we talk about him coming and correcting David. Uh, it was a it was a tough task before Nathan. And you know, Nathan never said never said, uh, "Thus says the Lord, you are a sinner, you are an adulterer." That's not the way in which he he got communicated to him. You know what was going on, and he got communicated to Nathan that. Uh, he needs to bring correction into David's life. But, you know, he put it so beautifully in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. So he comes and he, he shares this uh, scenario to David and says, okay, here is this person and this is what he did. What do you think? Is he right? Is he wrong? Should he be punished? And uh, David gives him the answer and says, oh, that this, seem, this looks like a, a, a wrongdoing and this person should be punished. And then you know, it's very dramatic. And Nathan says, hey, it's you. You are the one who has sinned against God. And you are the one who has you know, committed uh, uh, the, these uh, sinful acts. And so David is convicted. No, it's it's a prophetic word, but it wasn't released in a in a direct way. So there is a creative way in which the prophetic word was released. Jeremiah, when you uh, read about Jeremiah, he uses the symbol of a broken pot to convey a message. So you know things like this. You you find creative expressions of the prophetic word. So every prophetic word was not necessarily uh, delivered with the attachment, thus says the Lord, not at all. Okay? So that is also something we understand from the Old Testament. Now, we'll move forward. Uh, here, the next uh, section here in our note says that there is a connection between music and the release of the prophetic anointing. So this we observe uh, in, in the way the prophet Samuel, uh, you know, he, he released the prophetic through his life. Uh, you uh, see that there was a company of prophets uh, associated with things like stringed instruments, tambourine, flute, harp, okay, and prophesying. When you study the book of Samuel, you, you see a connection over there. And, you know, uh, later on, again, we will study about Samuel and the prophets. Uh, but Samuel being a prophet knew 
that there is something about music okay, and uh, the association of music with the release of the prophetic anointing. And that is why uh, the prophets uh, uh, during the time of Samuel also you know, engaged in uh, playing instruments. Okay, and then they prophesied. Now, one more really good example would be uh, in the life of uh, Elijah the prophet. This is in 2 Kings 3, where uh, you have King Jehoram, okay, who uh, wanted uh, King Jehoram, Jehoshaphat, and King of Judah. Okay. Uh, now, all these people, they paid a visit to Elisha and they wanted to hear from Elisha. They wanted a word from God, uh, whether, you know, they, about a battle and the outcome of the battle. And at this point, you know, Elisha, he asks for a musician to come. He asks for a musician to come. And uh, this musician begins to play. Uh, I think the verse is given here in our notes. So I'll just read it straight from our notes. 2 Kings 3, 15 and 16. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him and he said, thus says the Lord. So you have Elisha prophesying the mind of God to these kings about a battle. But when did the release of the prophetic anointing happen over Elisha? He knew the connection between music and the prophetic anointing. So he said, okay, bring me a musician. And once the musician played, it happens. Elisha begins, thus says the Lord, and the release of the word uh, over these kings. So something about the association of music and the prophetic okay, in the Old Testament. So how do we use it today? Uh, yes, we have our typical format of uh, praise and worship that we engage in in our, in our services or even in our personal worship, we could be engaging in things like this. Um, however, even when we want to hear from the Lord, waiting in the presence of the Lord, there's something about music, there's something about, you know, worship. When we are engaging in worship, uh, we can expect the flow of the prophetic anointing. Okay, so I'm just going to pause here. The Kishan has a question. Uh, Kishan, please unmute and ask. Hey, Kishan, do you have a question? Did you want to ask something? Okay, not sure about that. So uh, we will continue. We will come back later. All right, so uh, we see the uh, connection between music and the prophetic anointing. Now, the prophetic uh, is also associated with supernatural demonstrations. In the Old Testament, you know, uh, when you say prophecy, it was not, you know, you could kind of... Um, uh, a lot of people ask questions these days and say, when you talk about Prophet Elijah, Prophet Elisha, Jeremiah, you know, it was all so dramatic, supernatural, miracles were taking place. And when they said, thus says the Lord, this happened, that happened. But now, uh, it's not that, it's not as associated with the, the supernatural anymore, the prophetic, but, you know, you see a very, uh, like, it's very real and very big in the in the old testament you see that association of miracles and supernatural demonstrations in the old testament uh, but here in the new testament so even just releasing a prophetic word it might be the simplest thing that you and i do uh, but that is effective so you don't always associate uh, a prophetic uh, word with you know major supernatural demonstrations uh, as far as the uh, New Testament is concerned. But uh, definitely there is an association. Okay, I'm not saying that the supernatural is not associated with the prophetic. It is. It is very much uh, associated and we can expect the mighty miracles to take place uh, as far as the release of the prophetic anointing is concerned. But we see that kind uh, of a, a picture in the Old Testament because Moses 
you know, when he ministered, when he led the people, God spoke his word, sent him to Pharaoh. And do you remember when the plagues were happening and Moses, uh, uh, you know, went to Pharaoh and did all these things with the rod? He put the rod down, it turned into a snake, it, it uh, destroyed the snakes of the sorcerers. He took the rod up, he pointed to the sea and the sea opened up. So the prophetic, he hears from God, okay, do this. He does that. And then you have all these major, amazing, supernatural demonstrations of God's power uh, you know, that you just can't miss. Okay. So uh, you see that in, in the life of Moses. Take, for example, Elijah. Again, you know, Elijah, uh, uh, he is associated with so many miracles. You have Elisha you know, later on, who is associated with double the, the uh, demonstration of supernatural events as compared to Elijah. You know, they have um, uh, things like an axe that is floating in the river. Uh, and then even after Elisha dies, you know, the bones of Elisha, you see that somebody is raised back to dead. So, you know, amazing supernatural demonstrations take place in the Old Testament uh, and uh, many of which were associated with certain symbols even, uh, or, you know, when God said, okay, uh, the, the snakes are biting the people, you ho hold a bronze serpent, you hold it up high in the air. There was a symbol. It was a, it was a prophetic symbol. And uh, when people did that, God actually healed the people. So there, there was a demonstration there. Or take, for example, the widow of Zarephath. Okay? And this is a part of one of uh, Elisha's, Elijah's uh, uh, demonstrations of provision where there was nothing. And he just tells this woman, okay, you bring these jars, you fill them up, uh, and you know, they... Uh, they begin to overflow supernaturally. So these demonstrations took place in the Old Testament. And so we say that, you know, the prophetic is associated with the supernatural and mighty display of the miraculous. Uh, so that is also something we see in the Old Testament. Now, coming to the schools of prophets, I uh, made a mention of Samuel earlier. Uh, and in the first Samuel chapter 10, we saw how there were the company of prophets together and they used music uh, in the practice of their prophetic, uh, the release of the prophetic anointing. Now, in the book of Samuel, we can get this inference. Okay? We, we can get this inference from the things that are going on that Samuel probably established what is known as the school of prophets. Now, if we uh, study a little bit about the life of Samuel early on, we know that um, he was dedicated for ministry by his mother, uh, and he grew up with uh, the, the priest Eli, okay, in the temple. But during those days, we studied in the book of 1 Samuel that the word of the Lord was very rare or people did not, I wouldn't say they did not, uh, God was not speaking, but they did not know how to hear God's voice. Okay, so the scriptures tell us that not many people heard the voice of God. And during that time, you know, God calls uh, Samuel, he says, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel also doesn't know how to hear God's voice. And he doesn't know that it was God's voice. And so he reaches out to the priest Eli and the priest teaches him uh, that Samuel, what you are hearing is the voice of the Lord. You know, the next time you hear it, respond like this and say, okay, here I, uh, I am, Lord, speak to me, tell me, reveal your will to me. And so Samuel does that. So those are the beginnings of his training uh, in hearing the voice of the Lord. And later on, you know, we realize that Samuel uh, had what is known as the school of prophets, where there were many people who were trained to hear the voice of the Lord. So in 1 Samuel chapter 10, where we read that uh, there were prophets with tambourines and flutes and, uh, you know, they were prophesying. They were prophesying. How did so many prophets come together? it's likely that they were under training in Samuel's school of the prophets. What were they being trained on? How to perceive the voice of the Lord. So today, you know, there is a, a, a lot of uh, 
uh, you know, some displeasure when people hear about the prophetic and they hear about uh, prophetic schools, uh, they hear about prophetic training, and and uh, you know, people say, how can you how can you say that uh, you, we can be trained in the prophetic? Isn't that a grace from God? Isn't that a gift of the Holy Spirit? Shouldn't it? be uh, organic you know naturally uh, people hearing from god speaking god's god's word to others it's true it is a grace it is a gift but we can uh, we can grow in the understanding of this grace and the operation of the grace that god is releasing upon his people so even in the old testament you had prophets who were trained by samuel on how to hear and minister the word of God to people. And so similarly, even today, you know, we can, um, uh, people use terms like um, activated, you, are, you get activated in the prophetic. Well, these things wouldn't be wrong because uh, there, is, there is reference to uh, such training even in the old covenant. Uh, and, when we study a little bit more, you know, there's a lot more in our notes here, and I'm not going into the every line because if we do that, we will never really complete our portions. But uh, I would encourage you to go back and read. So you would see that uh, there are also places suggested where these prophets could have stayed, they could have trained, they could have ministered. Places like uh, it's mentioned that Gilgal was probably the headquarters you know, from where the school of the prophets function. Uh, then you have places like Bethel, Jericho. Okay? And uh, these trainees, uh, they probably um, uh, picked up from their mentors. So uh, a wonderful example would be that of Elijah and Elisha. Okay, So coming from the school of prophets that Samuel established, why did Samuel even establish the school of the prophets? I earlier mentioned to us that during his times, there were not many people who understood how to perceive the voice of the Lord. So he had come through that difficulty. He had come through that lack. And maybe you know, God uh, stirred him in his heart to not let the next generation um, be in that same situation. So he had picked up many things about hearing the voice of God. So uh, Samuel probably understood that, hey, it's important for us to train the next generation. What I went through, others shouldn't go through. And so he established the school and, uh, you know, prophets were being trained in a school. And then eventually, you know, people like Elijah, Elisha, because when you study about their association, their interaction, uh, it, it, it is as if, you know, there is a mentor and a mentee and the mentee is taking everything in, learning um, thoroughly from the mentor. And later, you know, even in, in the equation of Elisha, there is a Gehazi. Okay, so we see a pattern, we see a process that was probably established by Samuel um, uh, uh, and uh, people were equipped and trained to move in the prophetic. Now, again, you know, there is this uh, uh, discomfort that people have when you talk about training in the prophetic. You know, if God has anointed someone to be uh, an Elijah uh, or an Elisha, what what is the point of this person being a trainee but you see elisha being a mentee isn't it he journeyed with elijah elijah and he observed elijah's prophetic ministry the supernatural demonstrations through his life uh, and so what we realize is that even if one is called into the office of a prophet there is the equipping the training the a practice, you know, the learning. Uh, so there is a learning curve. Even in rising to our destiny as a prophet, if we are called into the office of a prophet. Okay? So uh, the prophetic does require training. Okay, and uh, it's quite biblical. All right, let's move on. Uh, some more understanding um, based on what is there in the Old Testament about the prophetic. So uh, this is not necessarily, you know, I'm not able to tell this to you like a story because everything is not connected to the next subject. Uh, however, so these are bits and pieces, but it just helps us establish an understanding of the prophetic anointing. Okay, so the next topic here is about the prophetic influence. 
Okay, so the prophetic influence. What is this? The prophetic influence simply means um, the working of the prophetic anointing, uh, even if you know somebody is not a part of it. Okay, and the classic example is uh, in Numbers eleven, where you have Moses. Okay, Moses who uh, wants to anoint uh, or he wants to um, delegate his responsibility to 70 elders. So he calls upon them and they come uh, and then, you know, he commissions them. However, there were two individuals who did not show up at this meeting. They were still in the tents. But you, know, you read in the passage that they were in the camp or in the tents and still when Moses was 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 releasing that prophetic anointing on the others because they needed God's grace to do the work of God you find those who are not in um, uh, how do I put it they they were not even physically close to Moses at that point they were far away but they were appointed for this task as well you find them prophesying right in the uh, tents so i'll read numbers 11 26 it's there in our notes it says but two men had remained in the camp the name of one was elder and the name of the other medad and the spirit rested upon them now they were among those who, those listed but who had not gone out to the tabernacle yet they prophesied in the camp so this is what we call as the prophetic influence so because by virtue of the fact that they were chosen, the anointing which was on Moses, you find a display of that anointing, not entirely, not entirely. See, you see, we will, hopefully we will discuss this also later. Uh, Moses had the anointing of leadership. Uh, he had wisdom. Uh, you know, he was, yes, uh, a prophet. But there were all these anointings. Now, when we say that these uh, leaders whom he had chosen prophesied in the camp, a part of what was upon Moses was displayed on these men in the camp. And so what did they do? They prophesied. Something very simple. They prophesied in the camp. So by virtue of a certain association, you see an influence. And they there are people moving under the prophetic anointing in the camp. Now, one more beautiful example of this is going back to the book of Samuel. First Samuel, uh, you have Saul, okay? Saul who is anointed as a king of, of uh, uh, God's people. And uh, when he is moving about, you know, he comes across a, a a, a, a group of prophets and these prophets were prophesying and they were the ones you know in first samuel 10 10 holding those tambourines and stringed instruments and all of that but you also read when sam saul who is anointed to be what he's not anointed to be prophet he's anointed to be king but saul comes in contact with the prophets saul begins to prophesy and then you wonder hey what's happening you know what's happening basically it's the prophetic influence okay so there is an influence uh, that can take place uh, by through association uh, now we we uh, maybe that's the reason uh, you had in the school of the prophets the trainees were encouraged to stick with the the senior prophet Okay, uh, Gehazi, stick with Elisha. Why? There is also an element of influence, right? So how do we, how can we understand this today? See, just by much of the fact that, you know, you listen to, uh, you listen to uh, teaching on the prophetic or you uh, attend a prophetic weekend school or you're taking this course, uh, the, the uh, course on understanding the prophetic. Can you expect the prophetic to be activated in your life very much yes because in the old testament 
we see that in action, the prophetic influence, right? That's the reason uh, I, I was, I, I don't know if I shared it in this class or some other class, but, you know, I attended so many weekend schools of uh, the prophetic uh, to understand the prophetic because initially when, um, as a believer, to some extent, yes, you know, I was hearing from God and, uh, uh, you know, seeing pictures and uh, sensing what the Lord was saying. All that was happening in my life, but not to the extent that I wanted. Uh, and so when Pastor wrote this book, I remember the very first weekend school that happened um, uh, that people were invited for. And I signed up for that very first one. And the book was, you know, the, the book was released and the book was used over there to study. And even at that prophetic weekend school, he went over all this and I was thinking, man, uh, nothing's happening to me. The prayer times and the, uh, you know, the we would have those demonstration sessions, huh? come together, pray now. Do you see something? Do you hear something? And I was like, God, nothing is happening. I can't, you know, uh, not to the extent that I want. But since then, you know, I've attended so many weekend schools. And in some way, you know, I feel like just staying on this journey has kind of activated something. Uh, and then eventually, eventually, as we prayed, there were sessions when, you know, pastor used to say, okay, y'all come, pray, do you see something, minister to this person, pray for this person, began to see, at least for me, I began to see some, you know, some picture, something, and I would share that word, and I would be amazed, I'd be like, oh my goodness, because that person can relate to it. That person would, you know, testify that, oh yeah, really, I, I am having pain over here in my abdomen, or this is going on in my personal life. How did you know? And I would be like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's finally uh, I'm I'm beginning to see something here. So the influence, you know, even staying on the journey when you're seeking, it's it's not that okay. I need all this theory, but you can pray and ask the Lord and say, God, activate this in my life. Because in the Old uh, Testament, you see the school of the prophets using all this true, all these truths and growing in the prophetic. So uh, I'm sure that it'll, it'll be a blessing for all of us. And I realize, you know, we've run out of time and I hope it's OK. Class, are you all uh, good? I, because I'm summarizing things. I'm not like going line by line from our notes, but I hope you are getting the essence of uh, what we are trying to get to here. Is this OK, everyone? Are you able to understand something? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. All right. So uh, let's uh, continue from where we've stopped. Um, I'm assuming there are no questions today. Okay, so we shall pray and uh, close the class. Oh, okay. Uh, Shri Kumar has a question. Let's take that up quickly, Shri Kumar. Yeah, Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. But Pastor, uh, as we discussed uh, from Colossian, Colossian 3.15, and as yeah. you said that the peace of God, Yes. So I just want uh, I know more clarity on that one thing. Mm. Uh, that, um, uh, for example, uh, many times uh, you know we expect so many th positive things and we feel good about it, and uh, and later you know uh, even after prayer, uh, you know when it turn uh, in a negative way. Mm. So how can we uh, come to a conclusion that what we felt that peace of God on that particular thing? Mm -hmm. Or, for example, it's connected with maybe um, any business contract or it may be, uh, you know, traveling somewhere for a, uh, you know, for a better opportunity. Yeah. And, you, and then you prayed and you feel you felt that like, a lot of peace um, mm -hmm. on that one thing. And later um, it didn't happen because that uh, because we believe that that peace is, uh, you know, is a confirmation of God. Mm -hmm. And we later go ahead and uh, nothing happened or. We later go ahead and everything turned, uh, you know, it became a mess for us. So mm. in addition, how we can uh, rely on that, uh, you know, that um, on that peace, uh, because, um, mm. you know, there is sometimes, you know, if there is a, so much uh, certainty is not there, uh, you mm. know, in that case, how can you, uh, how can we come to a conclusion or how can we tell the people that this is the peace of God with the way how, uh, you know, as you are explaining so, about the Urima to me, and uh, you know, the, yeah. the, that that's the way how they got the clarity on this. So how right. we can do that? Thank you, Pastor. Yes, thank, you. Sure. Right. thank you, thank you, Shri Kumar. Very uh, pertinent question. I'll answer it quickly because you know it's nine fifty now. Uh, so what I would say is, I've uh, posted a uh, posted a scripture here, Hebrews five fourteen, which says solid belo solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use 
reason of use have their senses exercised or trained their senses to discern both good and evil so this is also a training shri kumar as a believer what is that peace of the spirit because i could have a peace of the flesh where i really want something to happen and i i'm believing hard that the peace that i feel is from god but maybe it's not so the peace of the spirit is something that i have to train my senses so as i'm growing in the lord it's it, it's like i'm getting better and better at assessing is this peace from god is this peace uh, with the witness of the holy spirit is this peace because my decision is aligned with the word of god as well so you know all those tests happen within us and we get better at it so is it possible to go by peace and make mistakes yes it is sometimes we might make a decision thinking it's god's will um but uh, you know do your best and once you get into something hopefully it's not a big matter uh, you know it's not a big life decision hope if you do get into something and you figure out that no i shouldn't have taken this up or i shouldn't have done this you see how you could um, uh, you know sort of come back and uh, do once again hear from god and and pick up from there okay so i hope it answers your question yes, in a short yeah, yeah. yes 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 thank you thanks oh, okay me. great wonderful thank you so much okay kennedy i see your question here why are there classifications of major and minor prophets okay so we'll answer this in the next class kennedy hope you can hold on to that let's uh, wrap up for now uh, i i'll quickly pray and let's let's close uh, heavenly father thank you for lord this uh, uh, time that you've given us lord thank you for your word then god even as we look at your word we pray that you'll open up through to us and lord pour out your grace on us god that lord through this course each one of us will be strengthened lord in hearing from you we thank you once again we commit the rest of the day to your hands oh god in jesus name we pray amen amen okay thank you everyone yeah see you tomorrow see you tomorrow god bless thank you, thank you pastor yeah thank you bye thank you pastor thank you thank you bye everyone god bless